is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 184, covering the week of August 26th through August 30th, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to search for all those social media buttons, just go out to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. You'll get a daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You can also go to your mobile app store and get the Abbeville Institute on the go. Just do a search for Abbeville Institute. You get our free mobile app. That includes uh, access to all of our podcasts, all of our lectures, mobile access to the website. Again, free of charge, so you want to do that. Stay up with the Institute on the go. While you're at abbevilleinstitute.org, at the top of the page, you'll see a tab that says Support. Click on that. You'll have all our donor options. If you'd like to support our mission to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, click on that. We appreciate all of your support. It is tax deductible to the full extent of the law. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time donation. So consider doing that if you like the podcast, if you like our website, if you like our programs, if you like all the things that we do. And we have other things that we're trying to do behind the scenes right now, some big stuff we're working on. So uh, please consider a contribution. While you're there, you can also support the Institute by clicking on that Amazon Smile button. You can support the Institute while you shop at Amazon. When you purchase something, we get a little cut of that. So uh, you can make us your preferred nonprofit organization. You can also buy our apparel. So if you want to support the Institute and advertise for us, buy our Abbeville Institute apparel. Again, under that shop, under that uh, support tab, you've got a, a button that says shop. Click on that. Take you right out to our embroidered apparel. It's high quality stuff. It's not screen printed, so it will last a long time. All right. All that said, um, let's talk about the material for the week. And... Um, the, the general theme this week is essentially, what if the South had won, right? I mean, there are two pieces about that. What if the South had won? And I think this is an important distinction to make. Um, it's actually all the pieces can kind of relate to this in one way or another. Um, but this is a question that, uh, usually is given to the fiction writers, to those who practice historical inference, but what if the South had actually achieved independence? Uh, there is somebody on social media who said, well, the real question should be, what if Lincoln had never invaded? I mean, that is a question. Why did Lincoln invade to begin with? Uh, was it to free slaves or not? Of course, we know it wasn't. It was to enforce the laws of the Union, which was the tariffs and other uh, federal policy. But um, the fact is, what if the South had actually made it through the war for four years and achieved its independence in one way or another? Uh, it had been... Uh, it, it had been uh, an independent uh, federal republic for four years and then was able to come out of that. Um, the piece on Thursday by Ronnie Kennedy, you know, what if the South had its own Congress? And we've published a piece before, Bill Cawthon years ago, William Cawthon wrote a piece on this in the 1990s. I want to say it was the 1990, 1997 or 1998, somewhere in there, where he talked about, and he looked at statistically, what if the South had its own Congress, how would it vote? And when you look at all these issues that are before the United States Congress on a regular basis that people in the South get very worked up about, um, the South would actually vote in a different way than the North. And so the Kennedys point out several social issues, uh, but they also point out other things. Look, I mean, all Southerners that sit there and, and fret over this, well, the Congress is going to pass this legislation, hopefully the Senate will block it, or hopefully the President won't sign it. And we got to control those things. What he's saying is, I mean, this is irrelevant. We shouldn't be talking about these things. We should be talking about, well, what if you could have uh, real federalism in America? Or what if you could have decentralization? What if uh, New England wasn't determining what was best for the South? And these are questions that we brought up in our December conference. I'm sorry, November conference of last year, 2018 in Dallas, where we had multiple voices, people on the left, people on the right, talking about decentralization. It's something that's always been Don Livingston's pet project. Um, how should we think about America? Is America too big? And when you look at this piece and you look at what uh, Ronnie is saying here, he's simply saying, look, 
uh, all this angst that we put into to modern politics is really pointless. I mean, because uh, it doesn't matter if today the st it stops or tomorrow it stops. It's not going to stop ultimately. Uh, and even Northerners who get upset about the South, I mean, look, they're, they're upset with Mitch McConnell. Here's a guy from Kentucky. He's going to block their preferred legislation that comes out of the House. And so they get very upset about that. Well, what would happen if New England was allowed to legislate for New England and California for California and the South for the South? Then we wouldn't have these contentious political battles. New England could pass whatever legislation it wanted, social or otherwise. So could California and so could the South. So these, these regions would better reflect the political culture of the people there. Uh, and, and Kennedy points this out by saying, look, I mean, 70-something percent of Southerners voted this way compared to Northerners, uh, which voted the other way uh, on, on a variety of issues. And so did, I mean, again, years ago, William Cawthon. We actually published the piece on the website, and I can't remember the title of the piece now, but just look for William Cawthon, C-A-W-T-H-O-N, Cawthon, and uh, you'll find the piece that he wrote on the late William Cawthon. You'll, you'll find the piece that he wrote on uh, if the South was independent. It's very good. He went out and did a lot of research and um, figured out, you know, on these issues, this is how the South continually votes, on these issues, how the North votes. And so if the South was independent, this is how it would work. We'd have a drastically different government in the South. And, of course, people will immediately say, well, yeah, but it'd be racist. Well, this is where the piece on Tuesday, where Clyde Wilson wrote a review of a uh, series of books by uh, Howard White. It's a again, it's historical fiction, but it's called the CSA Trilogy. And uh, where maybe the South wouldn't have been that. I mean, we don't know. See, you can't you can't make the accusation that the South would have gone in this direction or that direction based on things that happened otherwise. I mean, one thing can change everything, right? So. Maybe the South is independent. How do we know how long uh, slavery would have existed in the South? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, we don't know if it would have continued for another 100 years, another 20 years. I mean, nobody knows because the South is not allowed to do anything about the institution on their own. Uh, and so this is, again, conjecture on both sides. I mean, look, when people say the South would have continued to be this or this, it's conjecture. You're, you're, it's a historical inference. You're basing it on, yes, things that you look at and say, well, uh, looking at southern states and the law in the states, slavery might have continued for 100 years. It might have. There's, there's no question about that. It might have. It also might have been abolished in 20 years. might have been abolished in 10 years. Nobody knows because it was not allowed to proceed in its own way as the North was um, and allowed to uh, end the institution on its own terms as the North did. So when you look at you know what happened, we know that, for example, Jim Crow was imported into the South from, uh, from the North. Uh, in fact, in Connecticut, in the antebellum period, that's what they called it. They called it Jim Crow. Then the, in the train cars there, you have to go stay in, you have, if you have a, a slave, you got to be in the Jim Crow cars, right? So this is in Connecticut, not in, not in the South. Um, and so, you know, we have enough evidence to show that the North was not the land of happy times and racial egalitarian utopia that people make it out to be. Um, we know we've known this for decades, but now because you got to have a foil, you got to have a bad guy. Well, the South is always the bad guy, and there's of course there's been a book uh, written years ago, "Better Off Without Him," where it says you know the South is really the drag on on the United States. This this particular author is saying let's just get rid of the South, let's boot the South out of the Union, then we can have our good. Uh, communist government here in the North. Well, I mean, again, the South tried to do this. They tried to say, look, why don't we just part as friends and say, okay, we're out. This is what Jefferson Davis was saying in his first inaugural address. We want to be left in peace. I had a, an individual uh, send me some uh, envelopes from the 1860s, images of envelopes. And uh, it's interesting to see these because the way that Davis is portrayed in these envelopes uh, primarily is as a thief. Right, so these Northerners thought that Davis was stealing part of the United States. He wasn't stealing anything. This is self determination in action. They also uh, mentioned that you know there's there's several times leave us alone, just leave us alone, and um, that was something the North was not going to do. They were not just going to leave the South alone. 
They had to conquer the South, right? Why did they have to conquer the South? Because the South was a great economic opportunity. It became a colony of the North. This is well documented. So um, this is a interesting question. If the South had the South was independent, if the South had its own Congress, if the South, if there was some type of regional government. If decentralization really was there, if we really believed in the principles of the founding generation, which was we need a limited central authority that only does certain things, and the states were allowed to do other stuff, and uh, of course, maybe even as we move forward in time, maybe that doesn't work, and maybe now we have regional governments, whatever the case may be. If that had happened, how would the United States look today? If New England was allowed to legislate for New England and California for California and the West for the West and the South for the South and the Midwest for the Midwest, I mean, how would that look today? Would it be contentious? Would there be peace? And uh, the the CSA trilogy, as, as Clyde points out, he thinks it's a fun read and uh, a nice question. Uh, the um, uh, There was a, a, a turtle dove produced a couple of books years ago. The first was The Guns of the South. And... Um, it's a little bit off because it's a it's a science fiction slash historical inference and but he does get into what you know what the South had won. They win the war in his book because South Africa figures out how to go back in time and they bring the South AK forty sevens and so they're able to win the war. Um, and this would be you know South Africa uh, because of segregation apartheid. But what he does say is that you know Lee wasn't interested in that. And he's a little bit off on the characters in the South and how things work. But Lee wasn't interested in that. Lee was. And Lee would end up winning the presidency and things would have been different in the South. But uh, regardless, you get these type of historical inference works and historical fiction, and they're fun. I mean, it's fun. Even when you don't necessarily agree with them, they're still fun to read. Uh, And that's what uh, Howard White has done. Uh, We also know that the South had some pretty interesting and uh, pretty interesting statesmen and and people that aren't necessarily well known. Uh, Sandy uh, Mitchum uh, wrote one, uh, wrote a piece on this on a uh, Monday on uh, <clears throat> Henry Watkins Allen, who was the at one point the wartime governor of Louisiana. And uh, Allen uh, was an interesting man. In fact, uh, Mitchum points out that Douglas Southall Freeman, uh, the great biographer of Robert E. Lee, wrote, Allen was the single greatest administrator produced by the Confederacy. His success in Louisiana indicates that he might have changed history if his talents could have been utilized by the Confederate government on a larger scale. Again, it's inference on what could have happened here, but uh, the fact is uh, Allen was a rock for Louisiana. I mean, this guy was uh, was a great, as he says, administrator. He was able to uh, get supplies to people regardless of who they were. Uh, he was able to um, uh, keep a frugal government and keep people focused on the war. Um and so I think that, um, and he said this, one, one day uh, Mitchum brings up, he said, uh, when a newspaper asked Allen why he was so honored by his people, Allen replied, it, quote, um, simply because he makes their good his highest, ob- or the newspaper responded, quote, simply because he makes their good his highest objective. He protects the weak, he relieves the needy, he rewards the faithful, he is in short, he in short exercises his every constitutional power with justice, reason, and humility. And he points out that a lot of children born in that period of time were named Allen. Even when Allen wasn't allowed on the ballot, there was a write-in campaign after the war, and Allen was uh, well represented by that write-in campaign. He finished second, even when he wasn't on the ballot. Amazing when you think about that. Um, so uh, you have these interesting people, and this is why Phil Lee on Friday, again, another great piece by Phil Lee, and uh, Phil Lee just had a piece published in the American Spectator. He's doing yeoman's work almost single-handedly out there trying to uh, draw attention to Confederate monuments and why they should be left alone. Now, the tide to take them down has kind of died down a little bit. Um, but it'll come back. I mean, it's it's not it's not over. And I think that the, uh, the SJW forces that have been trying to take these down have been thwarted by state laws. But they'll figure out a way around that eventually. I mean, you know, laws are, as we've seen, as Calhoun pointed out, you know, you, a Bill of Rights is worthless if you can't enforce it. A law is worthless if people aren't going to enforce it. Uh, we know that in North Carolina with Silent Sam, the, the state is not enforcing the law because they're not putting the statue back up. That's the law. The statue should have to be returned to its spot. 
and uh, they're not doing it. So the law is only good as those who are willing to enforce the law. Uh, but uh, Phil Lee, again, at our summer school, did a talk on Confederate monuments. This is a more extensive piece on some things that he said before. He had a shorter piece in the American Spectator this week, which is great because it's uh, the American Spectator still has some currency among uh, quote-unquote conservative circles. Um, it's a little bit more uh, fringy than uh, the, the National Review, uh, but still that he, the fact that he published there is a great indicator that people are at least some conservatives are still willing to talk about this in the terms of, you know, we don't need to take these things down. Not everyone has gone to the side of, the, of many of the neoconservatives saying, well, yeah, we should just take the Confederate statues down, but we got to leave up Washington. We got to leave up Jefferson. Well, I mean, there's your slippery slope. You can't, you can't take down one <clears throat> without ultimately understanding that the others are going to be taken down too. So uh, Lee has done a, a wonderful job here in this particular piece. And it was a nice lecture as well. And we're going to have the lectures available in their audio form um, in short order within uh, just a week or two, I would think. Uh, so you'll be able to get those on the app that I mentioned before, and you'll be able to go to the website and get them all free of charge. Uh, but this is a, a very good piece. Um, and some of these things we published, I mean, he, he included some things we published on the website before. <clears throat> Uh, but he brings out, and this is something I actually said in a in a uh, lecture I gave at Stone Mountain uh, several years ago, um, when I read off several of the inscriptions. Um, he says, when the inscriptions did address Southern causes, they tended to focus on constitutional rights, such as limited government and state sovereignty. One example from a statue removed in St. Louis reads, to the memory of the soldiers and sailors of the Southern Confederacy, who fought to uphold the right declared by the pen of Jefferson and achieved by the sword of Washington. With sublime self-sacrifice, they battled to preserve their independence of the states, which was won from Great Britain, and to perpetuate the constitutional government which is established by the fathers. Actuated by the purest patriotism, they performed deeds of prowess such as thrilled the heart of mankind with admiration. Um, and then Lee says, Valid point surrendered to the big government dogma of our age. Um... This is, I mean, this is important to point out the inscriptions because simply by saying, well, I mean, these, these statues are all put up to perpetuate white supremacy. Do the inscriptions say that? And of course, then of course, uh, Lee has gone into great detail on what is called car washing, right? Where Julian Carr made a speech at the Silent Sam where he talked about whipping an African-American woman. And so that's it. That's, it's all about race, but that's just one little part of the speech. And it's the only, it's really, if you look at the speeches, uh, there, you can't find much evidence of anything related to somehow these statues being put up in defense of white supremacy, quote-unquote. You can find evidence that they were put up to honor soldiers and sailors, to honor the dead. Every now and then you hear someone talking about defiance. We're defying, the, we're, we're, saying, we're still saying that uh, the South is important. We're not, we're not uh, going to capitulate and simply just be run over by the North. And that's what was happening during the during not only Reconstruction, which was over by the time most of these statues were put up, but uh, the South was an economic colony of the North, and Southerners were getting tired of it. it. I mean, look, when you say that these things were put up to perpetuate white supremacy, one of the things you have to then say that the opposite of that was was the belief in the rest of the United States, that there was somehow a movement to end, quote-unquote, white supremacy in the United States when these statues were going up, but that was simply not the case. There was no lasting movement in at any point. If you want to say it's in the 1890s, to the early 1900s, the early 19-teens, 1920s, there was no movement in the United States that had any political clout that Southerners were afraid of in any way that would have uh, ended white supremacy. Why? Because the North believed the exact same thing. Right? So... There has to be, if, if you say that these are put up for white supremacy, then there has to be a counter to that and saying that, well, there are people who are trying to push white supremacy away from general policy, whether it's at the state level or federal level. But that just wasn't the case. Nowhere was that the case. Uh, the North was just as racist as the South. And I mean, this is, this is true. I wrote a, a piece, is white supremacy an exclusively Southern ideology? Absolutely not. 
Um, so when you look at these things and you look what's happening here, you, you can't say that. I mean, there's no evidence of these things. There's no evidence that these statues are put up for any of those reasons. There was one in Louisiana, but it wasn't a Confederate monument. It's called the Liberty Monument, and it was put up because of a race riot in New Orleans, and that one was taken down. In fact, uh, Longstreet, James Longstreet, was involved in trying to put down that riot um, uh, for the side of the Republicans, right? So that statue was. I mean, you, if there's any statue that you could say, well, this statue was put up in honor of white supremacy. That was it. But that's the only one. That's the only one. And it wasn't a Confederate statue. It wasn't in honor of any Confederate soldier or sailor. It wasn't in honor of any Southern leader. It was in honor of a um, violent conflict between uh, two political factions in, uh, in Louisiana. So, I mean, if you want to say that, fine. Uh, and that one's gone now. Right? But these other monuments, you really can't make a case for it. Uh, and, of course, Lee does a very good job pointing out um, the problem of all of these statues. He, he Again, he points out that uh, one argument used by those wanting to remove Confederate statues is that contemporary blacks had little chance to oppose them when they were erected. Aside from anecdotal evidence that blacks joined white crowds who observed the dedication ceremonies, one example in Mississippi provides undeniable evidence of explicit high-level black support. In 1890, the Mississippi legislature voted on a bill to appropriate $10,000 for a Confederate monument. The vote in the lower chamber was 57 to 41 in favor. All six black representatives, all six black representatives voted yay. One, John F. Harris, made a supporting speech prior to the vote. Um, and then there's others. You know, he brings up some other things. Um, so, this particular argument that these things were put up for white supremacy falls apart from the beginning. I mean, there's no evidence of that. Yet, the myth continues. If there's any myth out there about uh, Southern history, that's one of them. The myth. Right? So we have this myth. Uh, David Blight has made quite a career of talking about myths and the myths that he perpetuates. So, I mean, this is, this is the problem with people like David Blight and Eric Foner, and others who perpetuate myths. Uh, now, uh, they would say, of course, there's a lost cause myth. I mean, so this idea of myth anyways, I mean, is myth really always false, or is it a perception? Is it a belief? Um, that term myth is often seen as when you say it's a myth, well, you're saying it's a lie, it's not true. Uh, myths are not always untrue. In the case of Blight, I would say some of the things he says are untrue, but and same thing with Foner. Uh, but, and they read too much into things to try to pull something out and with their own ideology at the basis of what they're doing. That's, that's problematic. Um, so, talking about those myths, though, brings us to the last piece of the week, Rediscovering Heritage by Nicole Williams. Um, she had been doing a lot of research into her family, um, and she said that uh, she had very little knowledge of her family's history, and um, but uh, didn't have any knowledge really about their ancestors. And um, she said almost a decade ago, she began to investigate family history. And uh, she said it really changed her outlook on, on life. Um, and she starts talking about the different people that uh, she found that were in her family and, and who they were. Um, and this is important. Um, she says, that, nonetheless, I had the joy of experiencing a bit of my family's tradition, heritage, and sense of place. There are always hints of who came before, pictures of people I did not know, holidays in northern Alabama, and family reunions in Betty's Creek Valley and the Blue Ridge. This imparted within me a sense that I am but a part of a much larger narrative, but finding more about that story was always beyond my reach. Um, and she said, uncovering that my ancestors, like many Southerners, settled America during the colonial era of the 17th and 18th, and 18th centuries was a revelation. These ancestors were part of the settlement of the Tidewater region of Virginia, the French and Indian War, Bacon's Rebellion, the first settlers in Maryland, the North Carolina Regulator War, and the entirety of the Southern Campaign for American Independence. None of these events were taught in history courses in my high school or at university. The conquest of the South by the North, along with modernity itself, has attempted to wipe away Southern heritage, and by extension the South as a nation with, within the greater United States. 
She says, we in the South have allowed our birthright to be forgotten, demolished, and tossed aside in the pursuit of materialism in a post-industrial economy. We know that something has been lost. You see it in the adverts for DNA testing for heritage clothing brands and the revival of traditional craftsmanship. Evidence surrounds us that the promise of consumer culture and the rise of technology has left an entire generation of Americans feeling that they have no purpose, lonely, disconnected from society, and no stake in the places in which they live. Um, and she said this is a tragedy, right? This is why Bradford said we need to remember who we are. And this is for all people, for all people. I think one thing that needs to be said is you can't fault anyone for trying to remember who they are and trying to have a better understanding of where they came from. It doesn't matter who they are. A better understanding for where they came from, for who their people are and their traditions and culture. This is across the board in America. There's no, There should be no issue with that. The problem is when you make these things a weapon uh, or you distort things. Um, and this is being done on a large scale uh, by... Americans of various groups, not just one group or another group, but various groups. And all she's saying here is remembering who you are is important. Remembering that uh, you have a viable tradition, a viable people. Um, one thing that I was, oh, it's, it's amazing. You know, you have, uh, for example, China has such a closed civilization. And they remember, they know who they are. The Chinese know who they are. They have a long, a very long culture and traditional history. Uh, they have all the different parts of Chinese history that we, I mean, this is why people go to Chinese restaurants and uh, they enjoy the architecture and they enjoy the music, whatever the case may be. They enjoy these things that are distinctively Chinese. And, uh, and there's that part of this. This is why people used to travel in the South because they enjoyed those things that were distinctively Southern. But when you take all that away, when you strip all that out, you're left with nothing. So remembering who you are is important. Um, and that's when, when you lose that, you lose something. When you lose that tradition, you lose the anchor that keeps you, um, uh, attached the continuity with the past. And that continuity with the past is so important when discussing, uh, when even thinking about moving forward in society. If you want to just say we're going to talk about you know prog progress and these kinds, of, but you have to have an anchor to do those things. So remembering who you are. If you've never read that, uh, that particular collection of essays by Mel Bradford, I would highly recommend it. Um, because he gets into this patrimony of the South, and he understands that that legacy, that patrimony, is one of the most important things we can bring out of Southern history. And this is why the Abbeville Institute really exists. I mean, exploring what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Not every, I mean, look, as I've said before, every tradition has thorns. Do you chop down the rose bush, though, because there are some thorns on it? Or do you smell the rose and think this is beautiful and continue to cultivate that bush, regardless of the fact that there are things that are unsavory about that bush? You continue to do it because it's fragrant, because it's beautiful. The Southern tradition is that. We can recognize the thorns. We can say, yes, these things were not good in the tradition. These things are not things that we don't want to continue in the tradition. These things are things that we wish never happened. You can't say they didn't. I mean, we wish they never happened. They did. So you just, okay, they happened. Move on. But we have this beautiful rose on the top of the bush. We want to have that for generations left to come. You, you want to ensure that that rose bush is cultivated and that uh, you can take parts of that bush and plant them other places. Uh, the, the analogy of the South being a beautiful garden in need of cultivation. This is true. That garden analogy, that uh, agrarian analogy of the South is so important for understanding what the South actually is and what this tradition actually means for America. I used to say all the time on this podcast, the South is America, and I still firmly believe that. The South was, the Southern tradition was America. The Southern tradition still is the backbone of America. Um, and that tradition needs to be cultivated and nurtured. And this is exactly what the piece is saying. Find out who you are. Remember who you are. Remember your people. Remember Allen of Louisiana. That's an important part of our patrimony. 
Uh, remember the soldiers and sailors who fought for independence for four years. They were heroic people. Remember uh, the people that suffered deprivations there. Remember all the people in the South, those who supported the war and those who didn't. Uh, because that's an important part of identity. And that's that idea of Southern identity. This is why the piece on Confederate monuments was given. This is all about Southern identity. Remembering that the South is a unique place with unique people and unique culture. Until next time, good day. Good day.